What's going on folks? I'm The Lights and I'm gonna teach you how to Night Stalker. If there's one build in particular you're interested in and you just want to skip to the points and learn about the choices we make with a specific build and why, or you just wanna know what to equip so you can get back to playing, I'll have everything chaptered out so you can jump right to it. Anyway, let's get into it. Night Stalker, or Void Hunter, is one of the most powerful subclasses in Destiny 2 and has stood the test of time throughout the lifetime of the game in both PvE and PvP. It's infamous for its easy access to invisibility, allowing the Night Stalker player to hide from their problems. Let's break down the abilities. For supers, we've currently got three to choose from, with two different versions of Shadow Shot, aka two different versions of Shoot a Void Bow. More specifically, they are Deadfall and Mobius Quiver. Arrows from either super will stick to hard surfaces and then persist, tethering enemies together so they share damage, take 30% additional damage from all sources, which is the highest debuff in the game, suppresses them, makes them volatile, and each tethered enemy killed will spawn an orb of power for your allies. The deadfall variation will shoot a single arrow that does negligible damage, but pulls in enemies when it initially tethers them and tethers a much larger area than Quiver does and the tether will persist for 12 seconds. The Mobius Quiver variation shoots two volleys of three arrows each that do very not negligible damage and produce anchors that tether for six seconds. The other super is Spectral Blades, which is something we don't usually talk about, but I'll talk about it anyway, just to be thorough. You go invisible, gain damage resist, and pull out two daggers. You can then scurry around pretty fast with the invisibility that lasts until your super is over, or you break invis by using a light attack. You can then re-enter invis with your heavy attack. We don't talk about this super, at least in PvE, because the two Shadow Shot supers are among the best supers in the game, and Spectral Blade's damage is pretty pitiful for a super, along with roaming supers is generally not being preferential nowadays. For our class ability, we have the usual choice of Marksman's Dodge or Gambler's Dodge. Marksman's Dodge reloads the gun that you have out and has a 29 second base cooldown. Gambler's Dodge has a 38 second base cooldown and the ability to refresh your melee ability. The melee ability in question is going to be Smoke Bomb, no matter what, which at a base has a 90 second cooldown and throws a Smoke Bomb that does negligible damage, has a small area of effect and provides a 15% weakened debuff to enemies hit by the smoke. This sounds underwhelming, because it is, but we do have a few ways to add additional functionality through other parts of the kit. I suppose this is also a good time to talk about debuffs as well, as this is a core part of the Void Hunter and the main reason why you even play the class in the first place. The weakened debuff I just mentioned causes enemies under the effect of the debuff to take 15% increased damage from all sources throughout the debuff's duration. This effect is similar to the 30% debuff applied by the two Shadow Shot supers, but is just less potent. Volatile is a status effect that is applied to enemies that causes them to periodically explode while you incur further damage to them, which will damage them and enemies near them. Weapons with volatile rounds can also pierce barrier champion's shields by default. Suppression is a debuff that prevents enemies from doing literally anything except shoot their guns. So no hobgoblin immunity, no grenades, nothing like that. This also inherently stuns overload champions. And then finally for the subclass, our grenade choices are Vortex, Suppression, Void Wall, Void Spike, Magnetic, Scatter Grenade, and Axion Bolt. To keep things simple, I pretty much only use Vortex and Suppression Grenades, and so does pretty much everyone else in PvE. But you can try other stuff if you want. Next up is our Aspect Choices, of which there are three. The first one is the least complicated. It is Vanishing Step, which is going to give us two Fragment Slots and will cause us to go invisible after using our dodge. It should be noted that regardless of whether you have Marksman's or Gambler's Dodge equipped, the Vanishing Step Fragment will cause your dodge animation to be the same regardless, though the effects of the two dodges remain unchanged. Next up is Trapper's Ambush, which grants you one Fragment slot and makes your Smoke Bomb actually useful. Your Smoke Bomb will now detonate after a few seconds or after an enemy, you or an ally, walk into its range. If you or an ally are within range of the smoke when it detonates, it will grant you all invisibility. This aspect also grants the hunter an air dodge movement similar to the movement found from Phoenix Dive and Shatter Dive, though you can't use Eager Edge to skate with it, which is pretty lame. When you hit the ground after casting this ability, you will detonate your smoke bomb and consume its cooldown. 
though the invisibility duration is actually a couple seconds longer when it comes from the air dodge than when it comes from the normal cast of the smoke bomb. The final aspect is the most interesting, and that is Stylish Executioner. When you defeat a Void debuff target, again, that's suppressed, weakened, or volatile, you will go invisible and gain wall hacks for a few seconds. Using a melee attack on an enemy to leave this form of invisibility will weaken the target that you melee. The invisibility from this aspect does have about a two second internal cooldown between procs of it, but otherwise it's basically just permanent invis as long as you can keep killing things. Now on to fragments, and there's a lot. To simplify things, I'm not going to explain them all. Just the eight that I think are the best. It's not that the others are bad, but void fragments are really strong, and three to four fragment slots means we've gotta be a little choosy. If you're curious why I didn't include a certain fragment, feel free to comment, and I'd be happy to explain my reasoning for doing so. First up, Echo of Harvest. Defeating weakened targets with precision final blows will create an orb of power, incurs a minus 10 intellect penalty. Orbs are really strong, especially with the new mods. Hunter can apply Weaken a lot. No one cares about Intellect anyway, so it's a solid fragment overall, though it won't always make the cut. Echo of Obscurity. Finish your final blows grant invisibility and gives you plus 10 to recovery. Another way to go invisible might seem like overkill, and it often is, but having an extra get out of jail free card can allow you to be confident while playing much more aggressively than you might otherwise be able to without the fragment. This fragment is also a staple in builds based around getting finishers in endgame content, like with the Aeon's Gauntlets, for example. Echo of Remnants, your lingering grenade effects last longer. If you are one of the overwhelming majority of people that use vortex grenades for your void subclass in PvE, then this fragment is quite good. There are often better fragments that play into the build a bit better, and we'll talk more about why later, but it's a solid fragment overall. Echo of Persistence. Void buffs applied to you, that's invisibility, overshields, and devour, last longer. This incurs a minus 10 to your mobility. This fragment adds an extra roughly two seconds to any of the effects that I mentioned, and the fragment on Hunter is a certified banger. And while you think the extra invisibility uptime is overkill, I want you to consider the fact that Hunter is uniquely positioned relative to the other Void subclasses to take advantage of all three of the Void buffs with very good uptime if you build into it. That gives this fragment a ton of value in those builds. This is one of two fragments that I never take off while playing the subclass, regardless of my build. Echo of Starvation. Picking up an Orb of Power or a Void Breach grants Devour, minus 10 to Recovery. This is one of the most powerful Void Fragments in the game, as the buff applied to your character while under the effects of Devour is ludicrous. While you have Devour active, every kill that you get refunds a decent chunk of your grenade energy, your entire health bar instantly, and adds to the duration of the buff. Echo of Undermining. Void Grenades weaken enemies. Minus 20 to Discipline. Minus 20 to Discipline is obviously pretty steep, but it is well worth it. The 15% damage increase to any damage you deal to anything that's been hit by your grenade is really strong. This buff also applies to the grenade itself. It's an insane fragment, and this is the other one that I'd never take off. New one here, Echo of Cessation. Defeating volatile targets creates void breaches. Finishing a combatant creates a volatile explosion around them, spreading volatile. I suppose this is a good time to divulge what exactly void breaches are. They're these little purple things that sit a little off the ground and they give you some class ability energy when you pick them up or, more relevantly, grant you Devour when paired with the Echo of Starvation fragment, which to me is the only real use of this fragment as the finisher part is just pretty meh. That's not to say it's a bad fragment though, as its functionality with Starvation on its own is enough to run it in most builds, at least that use Echo of Starvation as well. But now let's get into those builds. Builds in Destiny revolve mostly around the exotic that you choose to pair with your subclass, but there are also some class neutral exotics that pair well enough with the Night Soccer kit for them to warrant a mention. Garfunkel Falcon's Hauberk is first up, as I feel it facilitates the strongest Void Hunter build across the widest breadth of content currently. A revelation that I'm sure will come as a surprise to absolutely no one that knows what it does. The exotics perk is your Void weapons gain volatile rounds after you emerge from being invisible. When you are invisible and defeat a combatant while using a finisher, all of your weapons gain bonus damage, you and your nearby allies gain a reserve overshield and improved class ability regeneration. 
These reserve overshields can be deployed by using a class ability. So the second half of the perk is actually pretty good and a little underrated, so we'll talk about that a bit more in a minute. But this would still be Void Hunter's best exotic even without it. Your Void weapons gain volatile rounds after you emerge from being invisible. Let, let's, let's analyze that a little bit and really put that into context, let it sink in. Volatile is a Void debuff. That will proc our stylish executioner aspect that gives us invisibility when we kill something that is volatile. So basically, killing something volatile gives us invisibility. And then invisibility gives us volatile. It's a self-sustaining loop and volatile rounds are just really good at a baseline. The second reason that this is good is actually really basic. And that is that this is Void Hunter's only offensive exotic choice that isn't tied to their super. The high debuff uptime, extremely good survivability from Invis, and good super are huge boons to the baseline subclass for sure, but the current ecosystem present in the game just demands such a high baseline level of slaying potential from a subclass, and Jer Falcons is really just Void Hunter's only way to meet that baseline. The power present in other builds in this game have made Void Hunter's utility and survivability anywhere from a luxury to niche to just outright irrelevant. Jer Falcons keeps the subclass competitive across all of the game's content, and let's break down what we pair with it. For supers, both Shadow Shot variations are very good at baseline, and you can select either with the knowledge that Mobius Quiver is better for burst damage and for boss encounters, and Deadfall is better for ad clear and for generating orbs for your team. A little tip about using Mobius Quiver in boss damage phases, by the way, is to wait to use your second volley until your super bar is about to run out to maximize the uptime of the debuff you're providing for your team. This will make its uptime on the debuff itself roughly equal to what you get from Deadfall. I'm going to skip over to Aspects next, where we're actually going to select Vanishing Step and Stylish Executioner. Not having Trapper's Ambush is going to leave our Smoke Bomb not all that useful. And as such, we're actually going to then pair this with Marksman's Dodge, which is a little rare. This might be a little surprising to some people that are familiar with the Hunter's Kit. And there's layers to why I feel that this is the better choice, and I feel pretty strongly that it is the better choice for this specific build, actually. The extra Fragment slot is a nice bonus over Trapper's Ambush, but Fragments are never going to be as strong as Aspects, or at least they shouldn't be, so that's not quite as relevant. When running Marksman's and Vanishing Step, we gain a Fragment slot, like we talked about, an unconditional, on-demand invisibility from our dodge that's on a 26-second base cooldown, with Gamblers and Trapper's Ambush, you would lose that Fragment slot, you would lose your on-demand unconditional cooldown as it is now tied to your melee ability, which has a much longer base cooldown than your dodge ever will, Gamblers or Marksmen's, and is tied to a stat that you really don't want to build into. And now, of course, you can reset your smoke cooldown with Gambler's Dodge, but your Gambler's Dodge is going to have a longer base cooldown than Marksman's Dodge, and requires you to be near enemies to even use its effect. The only true gain to be had from Gamblers and Trappers is in a situation where you have your Smoke Bomb, and you have your Gamblers Dodge up, and you have enemies nearby that you for some reason don't want to kill or just can't kill, you can in such a case use your Smoke, proc Gamblers from Invis, and Smoke again to chain a pretty long Invis together. But during this time, you're not killing anything, because if you shoot your gun, you'd break invis and have effectively used all those cooldowns just to proc the Jer Falcon's effect. There is the fact that your smokes make teammates invisible now too, but I really rarely see that get any sort of value outside of strategies like in the Lightblade Grandmaster to essentially not interact with the entire lamp section. And in such a case, you wouldn't run Jer Falcons anyway. All of this is to say, on this specific build, take Marksman's Dodge and Vanishing Step. Pair that with Stylish Executioner, your choice of Shadow Shot Super, and your choice of Grenade. For Fragments, the two mainstays of Persistence and Undermining are going to be great here again. From that point, you have some choices, but I would very, very highly recommend Echo of Starvation, as its effect is incredibly powerful, and with the abundance of orbs in the game currently, the activation requirement is quite easy to meet, especially in team content. An obvious pairing with Starvation and with Jir Falcons' Volatile procs is Cessation, creating Void Breaches, which give you another means to proc Devour, and just about everything you kill is going to be Volatile, so you'll be able to get this up a lot. 
If you feel like you have adequate devour uptime without cessation though, you can really go for any of the fragments I've mentioned, like Remnants, Obscurity, Harvest, or Reprisal. Obscurity in particular pairing quite well with the secondary effect of Drift Falcon's Hauberk, which basically you will gain a big buff to your class ability regeneration. You and nearby allies will get a the, the same buff to their class ability regeneration and some damage percent on your weapons as well. It's a pretty pretty good sized buff, but it doesn't last very long, so it's hard to take. On to armor now. The stat priority is still to first and foremost go for resilience even after the changes. 30% global damage resistance is still way too good to pass up. You could definitely get away with running less, but I think you are doing yourself a disservice even if you can make do without it. After you've got your 100 resilience, you'll want to go for anywhere from 50 to 100 mobility, depending on your build, but definitely no lower than 50. We'll talk about why it varies so much when we get into mods. I like to run 70 personally, just as like a baseline. From there, get as much recovery as you can. The second set of three stats aren't as integral to the build as they are with many other builds. This is because nearly all of our slaying power and survivability is coming directly from our weapons and from invisibility, not stuff like our grenades, super, or melee. And no matter how much we might wish we could spam grenades like Warlocks can, no amount of discipline is going to get us anywhere near that level of uptime. That said though, the weakened effect from Echo of Undermining and the grenade energy from Devour is enough that we'll still prioritize discipline over strength and intellect. Hitting somewhere around seven is nice, but it is of lower importance than hitting high marks in resilience, recovery, and mobility. For mods, slot first any relevant stat mods where you can fit them. And on your helmet, we're gonna start with a harmonic siphon mod at an absolute minimum to give you orbs of power to fuel Echo Starvation, as well as your other mods that we're gonna get into. From there, you can do your choice of either ammo finders or scouts, as well as other siphon mods if you expect to be getting rapid kills with a weapon of an element other than void. For arms, we actually have some of the more potent mods in the game present here, but as it is, just so happens, None of them are really all that potent on this build since we're really not spamming any abilities other than our dodge, kind of, but all of the mods have the potential to provide at least a little value, even if it's not as much as they would on the builds that they are balanced around. So you can kind of pick any two that sound cool to you. I run one bolstering detonation and one impact induction, though they really don't do much for this build due to your relatively low grenade and melee uptime. Also keep in mind that with these mods, each additional copy of the mod will have a diminished benefit, meaning that it is most efficient to run one of multiple than three of the same, for example. You know what? Honestly, just running some void loaders would be pretty good too, now that I'm thinking about it. And then in the final slot, I highly recommend font of discipline for an additional 30 discipline while your armor is charged, or even up to three for a total of 50 discipline when you're, when you're charged. Just keep in mind that these fonts function in the same way stats do meaning that your gains will completely stop once you hit 100 total. This mod will also make your armor charge decay over time. 10 seconds per stacks at base is how quickly they fall, fall off. Mods with this functionality, the, the blue ones that is, pair best with other time-based mods as opposed to the yellow charge consumer mods. So we'll be sticking with these blue mods for the build. For the chest slot, I would always run the two resist mods that you feel will help you the most with whatever activity you're doing at the least, like just the two at the very least. And then in the third slot, my recommendation is to just run a third resist mod, but you could also get away with like a single copy of charged up for a little better armor charge uptime. For your legs, Void Weapon Surge is a no brainer on a build focus completely around void weapons and getting kills with those weapons. You're gonna equip this mod for an additional 10, 17 or 22% bonus damage on your void weapons while you have armor charge. This is also where we're going to be talking about mobility. Our goal is to always hit 100 mobility, though we actually have quite a lot of ways of doing that. For example, the font of mobility mod here in the boots can offer 30 mobility for just one copy, leaving you with room for two void surges, which is what I personally prefer to run, and that's why I run 70 mobility. On top of this though, if you are running a lightweight frame weapon, like Funnel Web, for example, these weapons actually give a hidden plus 20 mobility while you are wielding them that actually does affect your dodge cooldown, which is what we care about. That's why we want this 100 mobility. So while wielding a lightweight weapon, 
And with Armor Charge active, a single copy of Fonted Mobility benefiting from that Armor Charge, you will effectively have 100 mobility even though your stats only say 50. Something to keep in mind. I don't really like counting on the plus 20 mobility from a lightweight frame on this build in particular since I like to use a wide variety of weapons with the build. So I just keep it on 70 and throw on the one mobility font, but you could definitely get away with running as low as 50 if you pair it with a lightweight weapon. For your class item, this is a similar situation to our arm slot where many of the super powerful mods present here just aren't really for us. The finisher mods are quite powerful if you want to run any of those as the only real requirement here is the mod Reaper. Reaper creates an orb of power when you score a weapon kill after using your class ability, which is literally the loop of this build. This mod was made for us. From there, I usually do one time dilation to help with the armor charge uptime a little bit and one bomber since I have the extra slot. For weapons, your energy slot is gonna be a void weapon that takes care of ad clear. A good workhorse void primary works great or an ad clearing void special weapon if you prefer, that works as well. In your kinetic slot, I'd recommend something that handles major killing well, such as a sniper fusion or exotics like Wither Horde or Izanagi's. Dizzy GLs are great too. For your heavy slot, spec as needed for the activity. You can pull out the Eager Edge Sword, Void Machine Guns work really, really well, and heavy weapons for boss damage as needed as well. The loop with this build is pretty simple. You'll dodge to go invis. You're gonna exit invis by killing an ad, which is gonna proc volatile rounds from G Falcon, therefore making you invisible off the kill so that you can proc volatile rounds from G Falcon again. You also made a orb from the mod Reaper when you did this. You can pick that orb up to activate all your mods and proc devour. So now every time you kill something at this point with your near permanent volatile rounds, you go invisible, full heal yourself, get some grenade energy. You're making tons of orbs. You're keeping everything going. Your teammates are probably making orbs too if they've got any sort of build at all. You may even have a weapon with repulsor brace. So you're getting an overshield off of every kill too. This build is literally shoot things in profit. Your grenade can be used to more quickly clear out some of the tighter clumps and groups of ads. Your smoke bomb can be used to weaken bigger targets or apply a quick debuff on an ad for you to activate stylish executioner's invis off if you're ever without your dodge. It's one of the strongest builds in the game. I'd really recommend you go give it a whirl. Orpheus Rig is up next, the old classic. With Orpheus Rig, you gain a third volley on your Mobius Quiver Super and enemies that die while tethered to your deadfall super will refund up to half of your super energy. The effect gained by running deadfall as opposed to Mobius Quiver is generally the stronger of the two, as while Mobius' damage does get a hefty increase from Orpheus Rigs, there's a better exotic to run for that purpose that we'll talk about later. Orpheus Rigs are at their best while using deadfall. In a team, in content with very high ad density and demand for heavy ad clear. In these cases, where you're tethering huge groups of adds, teammates are popping supers, they're slaying out, making tons of orbs all over the place, your super is pretty much just out all the time. And another thing to mention is that in Season 20, we have an artifact mod called Volatile Flow that gives void weapons volatile rounds after you pick up an orb. You can have crazy high uptime on this perk in the current sandbox, and when you have either Volatile Flow or you're in the type of content that is optimal that I just outlined for Orpheus Rig. I'd honestly recommend just copy pasting the entire Dirt Falcons build we just went over as you're, you're gonna get a ton of stylish executioner procs in these situations. These situations aren't necessarily the norm though and O-Rigs are still good outside of these situations so we're gonna throw together another build that will serve as the prototype for all the other builds going forward and one that you can more generally use with Orpheus Rig. This is gonna start with Gambler's Dodge. Your choice of grenade, Vanishing Step, and Trapper's Ambush, as the survivability on this setup is more consistent when you don't have as easy access to kills on void debuffed enemies and things like Grandmaster Nightfalls or just situations where you can't apply debuffs as readily as you can with something like Jura Falcons. We're gonna pair this with our two mainstays of Persistence and Undermining for Fragments with the third being a flex slot usually occupied by Echo of Obscurity for the extra survivability. But keep in mind that Echo of Harvest and Reprisal have greatly increased value with O-Rigs due to their contributions to super uptime. For armor mods, we're going to keep it much the same as we did with Jerf Falcons to start, but we can flex into a build that trades some slaying potential for better invisibility uptime if we feel like we need it. 
speccing for strength instead of discipline, for example, losing our font mods in favor of mods like melee kickstart on arms and utility kickstart on our class item can give us better uptime on our dodge and smoke bomb in order to keep us invisible for longer. Next up is Omni Oculus, which may just be the most powerful defensive exotic in the game. Powerful as it undoubtedly is, builds centered around Omni Oculus are outshined by builds for the more offensive exotics since the entirety of its power budget is spent bolstering the defensive capabilities of an already very defensive subclass. Omni Oculus grants you an additional charge of your smoke bomb, refunds half of your smoke bomb's cooldown per ally that you make invisible with it. This doesn't include yourself, but what does include yourself is the 50% damage resistance gained by anyone made invisible by your smoke bomb while they are invisible. So basically, you can make a team of three invisible with 50% damage resist permanently. It's pretty strong. So obviously this exotic would do next to nothing unless paired with the trapper's ambush aspect. So we'll start with that and add in the rest of the default build we talked about with Orpheus Rig, the ambush dodge, vortex grenade, Vanishing Step, and Echoes of Persistence, Undermining, and Obscurity. For armor mods and stats, since Omni Oculus is already refunding copious amounts of melee energy, we can go for the same mod setup as we did with Jura Falcons to help make our offensive capabilities a little less cringe. Graviton Forfeit is up next, and honestly a pretty slept on exotic in my opinion, and something I've used quite a bit for solo stuff. Graviton increases the duration of any of your invisibility effects, which stacks with Echo of Persistence. It gives you four times melee regeneration while you're invisible, which is increased by up to eight times melee regen when enemies are within 15 meters of you. It also throws in 100 recovery and 100 reload speed for all your weapons while you're invisible on top of this. With the buff to invis duration and melee regen that Graviton provides, maintaining 100% visibility uptime is actually pretty darn easy as long as you are waiting until the last second or so of your current invis duration before you reactivate invis. This is a concept that is core to any build centered around high invisibility uptime and the Void Hunter in general. Graviton, however, bolsters our invisibility capabilities to such a degree that you don't even actually need to run Gambler's Dodge for smoke bomb resets to keep 100% invis uptime. You just need 100 mobility and like 30 strength. This being the case, you can run either Marksman's or Gambler's, honestly. Not having the requirement of being close to an enemy when you use your dodge reduces the chance that you flub your combo and get stuck with your pants down as soon as your invis runs out. But gamblers can allow you to break out of invis a little more freely, though you'll often be wasting the extra melee regen you get from Graviton. I go Marksman's personally. They're both good. Choice is up to you. Class abilities aside, the same subclass setup we went with for Omni Oculus is going to work great again here, as will the mod and stat setup. Before we move on to non-subclass specific exotics, I want to mention that I didn't forget about Kepri Sting or Guizan Vest. I just feel that they are not strong enough at the moment to ever be a real consideration over the other options. Just wanted to put that little disclaimer out there. Our first neutral exotic is actually one that I find particularly important to talk about, and that is Aeon Swift. If you weren't aware, Aeons allow you to finish champions and mini bosses to spawn heavy ammo for your allies. You don't get the heavy ammo yourself, but that hasn't stopped Aeons from being a staple in Grandmaster Nightfalls or tight damage checks in raids where heavy ammo is a limiting factor. This is of course in any season where there isn't an artifact mod that generates a similar effect. Void Hunter and its extremely high invisibility uptime as well as access to the Echo of Obscurity Fragment makes it, in my opinion, by far the most qualified class in the game for the role of performing Aeon's finishers since you can just sit invisible right next to a champion for as long as it takes for your teammates to whittle it into finisher range, finish it to make the ammo, go invisible again off the finisher and get out safe back to your team or move on to the next champion that you're gonna finish. Aeons are usually kind of a swap exotic that you use near to when you expect to need the ammo or actually use the finisher. But in GMs, where you have locked loadouts, you're going to be using Aeons the whole time if you opt to go that route, and in this case, you'll actually need to spec for things like Utility Kickstart in addition to 100 mobility in order to maintain permanent invisibility uptime. You can even go heavy into Strength if you want some extra insurance. Other than that, it's the same subclass, armor, stat, and mod setup as with the last few builds we talked about. 
Earlier on in the Orpheus Rigs section, I mentioned that there was a better option for pure Mobius Quiver damage than Orpheus Rig, and that is Star Eater Scales. Star Eater Scales allows you to overcharge your super by picking up orbs with your super full. And when using your super with max stacks, which is four, your super damage is increased by 80%. This is of course simply mathematically superior to Orpheus Rigs for just pure damage as long as you can get the stacks. Since an extra volley is essentially just 50% increased damage. Another thing that's relevant to mention is because the window to use your Mobius Quiver charges doesn't increase when you're using Orpheus Rig, you are taking longer than Star Eaters to do less damage than Star Eaters, and you don't even apply the debuff for longer since you can't space out your Quiver shots more. So basically just always run Star Eaters over Orpheus Rig for any boss encounter where you are using Mobius Quiver. So that's the video. That's how to night soccer. If you're curious why I didn't mention some other just generally useful Hunter exotics like Stoppies, Frosties, Six Coyote, other stuff like that, that's because those exotics don't really require anything in particular and you can kind of copy and paste any of the builds on them and they'll be useful. Maybe not as useful as some of the builds with the exotics tailored to the subclass, but they'll work. That all said, thanks so much for sticking around to the end. I hope you enjoyed, hope you learned something. At any rate, please do consider subscribing to The Lights One here on YouTube, check me out on Twitch, leave a comment on the video, why I'm an idiot and Marksman's Dodge is terrible. Also like the video if you liked it, and uh, thanks so much guys, have a good one.